So welcome to today's e-showcase, scalability and automation, who's the weakest link? I would like to thank GE Digital for sponsoring today's event. Today's presenter is Amy Wooten, who's a product manager for GE Digital's automation software, including the new cross-platform visualization, control, and OT BI solution, Prophecy Operations Hub. Amy has served for 10 plus years at GE in, in a variety of roles, including product management, engineering, technical product management, and user experience. And now I will hand the microphone over to Amy. I'm sorry, I have a bit of a sketchy break. Unfortunately, I got sick here in the last few days, but despite that, I really am excited to talk with you today about this topic, uh, and I'm excited to be here. All right, so before we get started, I just wanted to give you some background on who we are as a, a GE Digital uh, within the greater GE. So I'm sure folks can see here on the right-hand side, there are many divisions within GE, and you may be already familiar with some of them, including GE Power, GE Renewable Energy, GE Aviation, and GE Healthcare. Here in GE Digital, we are really focused on industrial software. And that's industrial software to support both the various divisions uh, within GE, such as power and aviation, but that's also to support external customers. So for us in the manufacturing side, which is the group that I'm a part of, we have over 18,000 global customers across a diverse set of industries. And our goal here is really to help our customers accelerate global transitions that will ultimately impact every industry on the planet. So with that, let's go ahead and dive in and get started with the presentation. All right, so if you think about scalability, you know, a lot of times folks will look at bullet number three and think about it in terms of performance. And yes, that's absolutely, you know, one area to think about, but really it's not just the performance of the systems that we need to be concerned with, right? It includes things like development and rollout, uh, scalability for maintenance, you know, the vulnerability and security of our system and accessibility as well, right? Both accessibility to the data as well as visualization of the data. And so if we sort of return back to the topic of this webinar, right? Scalability and automation, who is the weakest link? We sort of give away the answer here on the first slide. Any of these can be the weakest link uh, if you don't look at these sort of holistically as you try to build out your solution and deploy it and manage it over time. So we're going to be going into each of these in a lot more detail today. All right, so let's go ahead and get started with development and rollout. Okay, so one thing I want to talk about here, you know, as you're looking at systems and scaling, it's not just about scaling up, right? It's also about being able to scale down and start smaller. So that could be starting down at the sensor level and being able to push up data from a sensor into higher level systems. And from there, when we talk about scaling, we're really moving up from, you know, a couple of points all the way into a large enterprise level visualization where you have access to all the data. So that could be on-prem, you know, like a level four network if you're looking at it from a Purdue model perspective, or it could be level five within the cloud. So as you're trying to do this, some key things to think about are, you know, having a common development tool set that enables that type of scale having a consistent experience, not just of your end application, but also for the development and configuration environment, and being able to use mechanisms like object-oriented modeling and templatized screen building to help capture commonality across many items while still managing their individual differences. You know, another thing I just wanna mention here is that we're definitely seeing um, acceleration of customers are looking to expand their capabilities into the cloud. And there's a couple reasons for this. And one of the key reasons is to really reduce the cost of infrastructure. As you start to move into the cloud, right, you can have things like hybrid cloud solutions. So you might still have your critical HMI schemas within the control network of the plant, right? Um, but then you can maybe start to move some of your non-critical systems into the cloud. And as you start to do this migration of your non-critical systems, uh, you begin to reduce the amount of maintenance and the amount of infrastructure you have on your plant floor. So reducing that cost is really one of the big drivers here. All 
Okay, so you know, as we are looking at um, deployment and scale, uh, one piece, uh, one way to look at this is from more like a server perspective or a systems perspective, right? So, you know, some things to really focus on here are, are you able to seamlessly integrate new components into your systems and solutions? Are you able to have consistent user experiences, like I mentioned earlier? The other key thing here, which I think is really important, um, you know, when you're thinking about scale, you want to think about solutions that have what we call a system of systems. So think of it kind of like a mesh network where you might have multiple servers deployed, right? You're able to achieve isolation through use of multiple servers and some topology, but you can also have isolation even within a single server. So, for example, you might want to isolate a line so that if one line goes down, the others remain operational. Another thing to think about here is aggregation. So, you know, in the case we just talked about, even though your lines are isolated, you can actually still have all those different lines be able to aggregate up to a higher level view to show you how you're doing as a port, and then also maybe even from there, show you how you're doing as an enterprise. And when you do that type of aggregation in a system of systems, you want to make sure that you're not storing the data in multiple places, right? So, you know, one of the things you can do, for example, uh, you can have an enterprise SCADA that has virtual pipes uh, down into the lower level SCADA. So, in that case, you can still have, you know, aggregated views, you can still have system of systems, but in an optimal way. Of course, you know, you do still want to consider your system in terms of performance, um, but also think about it in context of upgradability, right? So the key thing here to think about is reducing downtime. You want to minimize downtime on upgrades as well as updates because obviously downtime is costly, right? It's a large cost, so you want to focus on minimizing that as part of possible, and you know, upgrades and updates are, are part of that equation. All right, so digging a little bit more here into the client side, um, a key thing here is to recognize who are your personas and users, how do they need to be able to access data, and which data do they need to be able to access. Based on that, you know, we believe it's not a single solution or a single way of access that fits everyone. It's really based on understanding, you know, that what your users are, you know, their specific needs and their use cases. So, you know, folks, many folks do like same clients, for example, but, you know, for some industries, it might make sense to have sick clients for operators to do execution. But then if you have someone maybe like a plant manager or GM, right, they may not even be within the plant network. In those cases, you know, if they're more mobile, um, they may need a more way-based solution or a more mobile application. So they can actually see, you know, right on their phone or their watch, um, you know, what the status is and what's going on. Another example, again, you know, plant manager, line supervisor, maybe this time still within the plant, but they're more mobile, they're not sort of chained to a, a you know, desk area. Maybe for them it's really critical to have things like add-ons or alerts where they can tell if there is some situation where support is needed. So they might actually need, you know, a notification on their watch so that no matter where they are, uh, you know, as they go through on uh, site, um, if this is something that needs critical attention immediately, they can immediately respond and support their team. So, you know, as you look in SQL, it's important to make sure that you look at technologies that support things like web-based applications that can work responsibly on multiple devices things like terminal service access, and at the same time, you know, still providing connectivity in a way that is, you know, standardized and provides interoperability, especially if you're going to be using multiple vendors uh, and, and different technologies as well. <coughs> okay, so we just talked about some aspects of deployment and users and ensuring you have the right set of technologies to support those users. But another area to think about is configuration and building, right? So to scale effectively, one key area is how quickly and easy is it for you to be able to build and modify, you know, the appropriate systems and applications based on your requirements and needs, as well as your stakeholders' requirements and needs. So this is really critical because, 
what we're seeing is, you know, more and more, there's more data that's being connected to and sensors being added to the system. And as this happens, right, stakeholders are continually asking for visibility into that data. So these systems are not static, right? You're continually making changes to them. In that regard, it's critical to be able to have something like rapid application development. So this allows more people within your organization to be able to build or customize the necessary applications and screens with a low code or no code touch. You know, if they don't need to have specialized software development skills, you're basically enabling more folks in your organization to make the changes that they need instead of waiting for someone with that specific technical programming skill set. Another important piece here to mention is, you know, having sufficient out of the box capabilities. It is coupled with uh, flexible applications that can be easily extended and customized. So again, this is really just a way for you to have a faster start in your journey, you know, having sufficient out of the box um, content and then being able to quickly and easily extend it as well as being able to develop custom content on, on your own. All right, so now let's think about scale and improvements from a higher level, sort of the macro perspective of plant enterprises. You know, in general, you don't want to go and create something new or make wide sweeping changes across multiple plants or your entire enterprise at one time. That can be, you know, typically pretty risky. Generally, the way to be most effective is to start with your first implementation, sort of like you see here with site one, then make changes and ensure that you're seeing the expected results and outcomes. <coughs> Right? And then, so if, if you do that and you say, hey, yes, I'm seeing what I expected to see, you know, we have good outcomes here, um, then what you want to be able to do is to, to take that and sort of roll out those changes to another plant and so on and so forth and turn those into best practices. And the goal here is, you know, not just to have best practices that are tribal knowledge within one site or driven by, you know, specific personnel who are part of your organization at a particular period of time. What you really want to do is, take those best practices and build them into software automation so that you can implement them across your inter entire enterprise. Right? So that's, that's really one way of looking at it, right? You know, the idea of starting small, making changes, and pushing those across to additional sites. As we go to the enterprise level, right, another thing you might start to think about is central management. Um, you know, so things like, um, how can you have solutions with technology that allow you to essentially manage your best practices and your application solutions? And then being able to push down, right, from the enterprise level, down and out to all your plants within your enterprise. So those are some of the things you might want to think about, you know, in order to be effective at scale while doing global rollouts. Um, you know, taking those improvements, which have led to great results within one plant, and sort of pushing them across the, the entire enterprise. All right, so we've covered a bit of ground, uh, and I just want to summarize, um, you know, a couple of points here to consider when you're thinking about deployment and rollout and, and development and maintenance. So number one here <coughs> is really focusing on the critical piece of installation. You know, does it require subject matter, matter experts, or is it easy to do? You know, do you have the right skilled staff on hand? And will they be able to help with the install, or do you have to have folks with very specific skill sets? And are folks able to, you know, do these installs within minutes and hours, or does it take days and weeks and months? Number two here is, uh, you know, really focusing on, on configuration, which I mentioned earlier, right? So you want to have technology and tools that puts everything in a single pane of glass. You know, for you to do development, right? Um, but also for users to have access to information. And you want to have a, a tool set which will allow you to build applications and perform configuration in what we call like a WYSIWYG manner. So what you see is what you get. This is, you know, typically you think of this as like, hey, I can do drag and drop. You're able to see the changes immediately and you're able to, to test those changes before deploying it. And again here, the goal is really to not require specialized software development skills or to have to hire development, developers to build, 
um, because that's costly, right? And then you don't want to get in a situation where you have to sort of pre-design everything and it's expensive to make. Um, really, you want to do everything more in a lean manner where you can sort of incrementally make changes and test them out. All right, and then there's data availability. So it's really critical to ensure that data is available in a way that's fast and easy to access. So there's critical thinking um, that needs to take place here about your overall infrastructure in the network, how your systems are connected, uh, how interoperability between those different systems works, you know, especially if you're dealing with systems from different vendors. And then sort of at the end there, you know, how do you bring context across all of that data and make it most effective for users to make informed decisions. And of course, with data um, comes accessibility of the data and ensuring that folks are able to digest, you know, and make sense of the information that they're seeing. And this is really where visualization comes in. Um, providing both the data and ensuring that it is accessible, you know, not only within the control network or within the plant, but also providing things like remote access for people like subject matter experts who can support if they're not within the plant and, um, and they might be able to help out with things and responses in abnormal situations much faster. All right, and then lastly here, um, the other key thing to consider is maintenance. So, you know, there's gonna be downtime where you want to do things, of course, like maintaining equipment, but there's also maintenance that comes up when updating hardware infrastructure or updating software to get the latest version or making changes to your software or configuration applications. So what you really want here is to make sure you have a good process and good tools to do that quickly and easily. You know, not just, um, you know, at the level of one line or one plant, but across your entire enterprise. <coughs> All right, so let's go ahead and talk a little bit about performance. Okay. So when we talk about performance again, you know, it's really thinking about your users and their specific scenarios because performance needs are not always the same. I think I'm going to start off this discussion with talking about time because that's probably one of the most critical things here. So there are different needs and different expectations depending on if you are in the control network and at the automation and schedule level, right? Because in those situations, you know, as you're scaling, the focus here is that you really need a robust solution that can respond in sub-second to second time frame. As you go from that level zero or level one, you know, again, with the Purdue model network, um, and then go to something like a level two or level three, something like an MES, uh, you know, now if there's something like quality information that you're entering or viewing, that could probably be something like a one second or a few seconds up to a few minutes. And then, you know, as you think about moving to higher levels, like level four or level five, and going to, to systems like ERPs or doing analytics, right, it could be that you're doing something where you're data mining millions of data points. And depending on what you're doing, that might actually even take things like hours, you know, being able to actually run, um, you know, analytics, mine the data and getting insights. So really, you know, this paints a, a larger picture with you know, differing time, time horizons of, of when data is needed, right? And this is about making sure that you have a robust network and software to let you have this level of scale and performance in a way that's also effective um, from a cost perspective. All right, so I wanna talk about data a little bit more specifically and you know, how these different performance expectations relate to industrial data and industrial data management. So, <clears throat> as I said, you know, there's real-time data, like sub-seconds, and there's also near real-time data. And in many cases, for folks that aren't doing um, operations execution, what they really need is near real-time. So that could be someone like a process engineer or someone like a maintenance engineer or as I mentioned before, like plant managers, right? But then if you think about it, you know, when you're looking at historical data, even that can amount to a, a really large amount of data. So when you have to consider, you know, scaling, you need to think about what is your optimal storage for data? You know, very small systems, 
Now, if you're small enough, you can probably start with something like a relational database. So we customers, as they scale, they just begin to have you know, massive amounts of data. And as they're adding more and more sensors, at some point, relational databases just don't meet the expected performance. And so, of course, there's you know, performance in being terms of being able to access the data, um, but even more so, there's data storage, right? Because what you don't want is to have a huge burden and cost of having, you know, tons of different servers where you're trying to manage and store all that data versus doing something like, you know, optimizing your storage using time data storage, you know, something like a specific technology for like historians, right? So that will really help you from a cost perspective as well as a performance perspective as well and just management, right? We had a customer, a really long-standing customer who has using relational databases and they actually ran into a situation where they went beyond the specifications of what Microsoft supports and they just had such a high cost being able to like, trying to manage all of their servers. And over time, we were able to move them over to Historian and ultimately this is a much more manageable solution for them. Okay. So beyond the storage of data, we also need to consider performance when accessing data. So depending on scaling and your deployment, right, you could have a highly distributed environment. And for those situations, you know, you want to look at mechanisms that are low bandwidth and that are actually reporting data by exception or by event rather than pulling or continually pulling for data. In other situations, you know, for example, within a plant, Sometimes pulling is useful and effective. So again, it's really about understanding the scenario, understanding you know, how real time the data needs to be, what is the bandwidth of the network, and the particulars of the infrastructures that might impact the way that you retrieve data from those source systems. The other key thing to think about here when looking at your technology stack is you, know, you want to find solutions and technologies that can help you minimize the amount of load that you're putting on your execution system. So what I mean by this is, you know, say you have a lot of different applications and you're building more applications for stakeholders and more users across your enterprise. <coughs> what you don't want to have is, you know, have all those different applications individually putting a load on your control system. You know, what you probably would rather have do is, you know, find technologies and solutions that are a bit more sophisticated with the routing. So if there's multiple applications that are making the same requests for the same data, right? These systems should be intelligent enough that they can recognize, hey, it's the same request. And they only make the request once to the control system or the execution system. And that really reduces the load, you know, on that end. So that way, you know, you still have um, optimal performance within the execution piece, but you also have that added accessibility to the data for all of your stakeholders. And the final thing I want to mention here again um, is cloud. And you should again you think about who needs access to the data and how they're going to access the data. So, you know, there's real time data, which often needs to be accessed immediately, right? There is near real time data for doing things like analysis and where you would maybe need, for example, the last six months of data. And those types of data, you know, you'd want them within the plants for users. Especially if they lost connectivity, they can still be able to work and do what they do, even in abnormal situations. So they'd still be able to access those systems within your plant um, and, and still have those working in their environment. But then there's also data, which is a bit further out for doing things like, you know, analysis and analytics. And this is what we probably call something like cold storage within the cloud, right? So you don't have to access it as often. So again, it's really thinking about how do you optimize your system that gives you access to the data and where you store the data so you can be effective for all of your particular scenarios. All right, so with that, let's talk about the cost of vulnerability and this really comes back to security as well. All right, so I think this is a really good statement about that. You know, when you think about production data, it needs to be highly reliable and available to ensure not just the accuracy of the data and the ability to do operations execution, but also to enable operations optimization and quality for improvement. So 
So coming back to the starting point of this conversation when we talk about the weakest link. If you look at security goals, you know, generally, historically, from an IP perspective, the most important thing was confidentiality. So really ensuring that the right, only the right people had access to receive the right information. Number two was about integrity. So this is really about ensuring that the data and the quality of that data is good enough so that it's telling you what is truly happening, right? You can't make good decisions if your data quality is bad. And then sort of in last place was availability. And so if you look now from a traditional um, you know, industrial control system, it's actually the inverse generally. It was, you know, build what is this important thing. <coughs> You know, you really want to have access to the data and access to your systems um, for you. And then number two was integrity, and then confidentiality was number three. And so, you know, how has this changed, or is it still the same? Well, yes, <laughs> it has changed. As you can probably guess by the next slide, right? Uh, so yes, it has changed. Now, more than ever, um, we're looking at not that one is of higher importance than the other, they're actually all very, very important, right? We're seeing this and it's being recognized by both IT and OT staff that there are three pillars that you need to think about when it comes to your data and security and vulnerability. And this is relevant even to some of the things I mentioned earlier, right? So if you think about something like upgrades, um, if you're going to be able to scale effectively, you have to be able to do this in a secure manner. So you really need to make sure that you are on the latest version of software, because by being on the latest version, right, you can ensure that previously identified security, security vulnerabilities have been addressed. And this is really critical so you can feel confident um, of what you put in your plants in your enterprise. Number two is really thinking about redundancy and failover and high availability. So if you do have those systems in place, then if there's an issue that does arise, you have a quick and smooth failover. So there is minimal disruption to execution. And again, you know, the goal here, the goal here is really avoiding downtime and any gaps in data collection and storage, because often those gaps can be detrimental to your effectiveness as an organization. Okay, and number three, okay, as we talk to our customers, we've heard a lot of feedback around ease of use and ease of having both authentication and authorization in place. So specifically on the authentication side, you know, it seems like not having to manage users in multiple systems in the context of who the user is, right, authentication. So, for example, you don't want to have to create a user in Active Directory and then recreate it in one of your software systems and then recreate it again in yet another, a third application that you use, right? That's a huge burden of both IT and OT staff. Whereas, let's say, the ability to integrate, you know, all your software integrates with the Active Directory um, and, and be able to use what's already been defined uh, for identity management, um, being able to take advantage of technologies like multi-domain support, active directory hierarchies, et cetera. Another key part here is, you know, not just having sort of a single definition of the user, but ensuring the authentication itself is most secure. Now, this is things like having multi-factor authentication um, as a technology within your system. I'm sure folks have already started to say that, you know, this is not just, you know, signing into a system, but typically it's a, a second um, mechanism for, for authentication. So things like, you know, getting a ping on your, your phone and having to type in a code, or even using biometrics, which can be something like a thumbprint scanner. All right, so let's move on to accessibility. Okay, so when I say accessibility, um, what I'm really talking about here is giving accessibility of data information to everyone in the enterprise in an optimal way. So what that really requires then is an optimal visualization of that information that can scale to all stakeholders in an effective manner. So a key part of this is ensuring that you have a single source of truth for data, but also from a visualization perspective, not forcing users to flip between multiple systems. So looking for solutions and systems that provide a way to aggregate all of the data and all the information in one place. So a user can then go into that one app or that one visualization platform and see everything that they need to make decisions and do their job on a day-to-day -day basis. 
the second part here, which we also talked about earlier, right, is, uh, you know, not creating a single application um, or solution, you know, but similar to our phones, having something that's more purpose built for our users and personas so that they can be most effective and they're only seeing the information that is relevant to them and that they need. So, you know, definitely you don't want to have uh, information overload where you have users and they're just inundated with information and they don't know where to go and what to do, right? Um, a better strategy here would be more of a task-based application to ensure that they have exactly what they need to do the certain things that they're trying to do. Again, based on your knowledge of that person, their role, and, and what they need. Um, another key thing to look at here is mobility, right? Uh, I probably don't have to say this, but our world is changing. Everyone has a smartphone. The expectation now is for folks uh, within, enterprise, within enterprises are different. So they expect to be able to walk away from their desk and be on their phone and still have access to information and be able to make decisions. And the last thing here, you know, I'll come back to again is having a single source of truth. Um, this is the goal that, you know, there is high collaboration between um, the right people making decisions. This is everything from, you know, folks who might be a subject matter expert, who might see something that's remotely happening on the plant floor, to having screen shares, right? You have multiple people that are looking at exactly what the operator is seeing and trying to assist them and, and providing that type of capability. Or maybe even, maybe even augmented reality might fit in this category as well. So those types of technologies are really helpful when you have abnormal situations where a person is doing something that isn't maybe a day-to-day -day task, right? Because these can provide a way to guide them so they're not as familiar with the activity. Um, so you want to help them do this activity more optimally and reduce the risk of them making a mistake. Take a little bit into an example of how this can be done, or it ha how it has rather been done at GE Tower. <clears throat> so if you think about GE Tower, right, these are large systems. These are critical systems that need to be up and running for customers to ensure that they can do, you know, their day-to-day -day jobs. Okay, so, you know, as we start to talk about this journey, we're going to start out here with two personas. One being the operator, which is inside the plant and sort of sitting side by side with the equipment. And then we have a supervisor who is in the control room, right? So not directly beside the equipment, but it's sort of looking at that overall system and monitoring it, and they have full control. So let's say that there's a situation, something happens where, um, you know, they see an issue and the operator and the supervisor talking together and something needs to be addressed, right? So let's say in this case that it's more effective to give control to the operator. The dissolution, um, what the control room software can do is to get them access to the plant floor operator very specifically for a period of time uh, for them to do the work that they need to do and for a very specific area uh, on the plant, right? So instead of giving access to everything, you can sort of minimize their errors by giving uh, access to that operator um, for that area that they need to work on. And as they do that, right? Um, that the control is given automatically uh, based on, on the action by the supervisor to the operator. They now have access, the operator has access, they're able to do things. They can look at things like face plates, they can do control, maybe they can look at some diagnostics. So they can make changes and control that piece of equipment, right? They're able to confirm action. <laughs> at the same time, right, the supervisor can be watching along and if there's something that they see or they need to intervene, they can still, you know, sort of take over or, you know, provide support and assist the operator as needed. <coughs> okay, and of course, you know, generally, hopefully everything goes well and the operator is able to finish up the task that they're trying to achieve and they would be able to, you know, release control and have it go back to the supervisor who's able to take back control of the system as well. And then from here on, right, <coughs> Uh, the operator should be enabled to continue monitoring their screens like normal, right? They may need to check for trending to make sure, you know, their processes are going back to normal and everything is within the spec that they want. So that's just one example here of, of how this sort of assisted, um, you know, collaborative uh, process might take place. Sorry, guys, I'm still losing my voice. 
All right, so a couple of things I want to mention about that example, right? So for a simple sake, you know, we showed the same interface on both the, the operator screen and the supervisor screen. But as we look at those things, as we speak to customers and we build solutions, right? Um, you know, a really critical thing to think about here is when you have those operate, sorry, those supervisors and you have folks looking across the plants or across systems to be, you know, optimal and most efficient and elim eliminate errors. A key learning here is you don't just want to show all the screens on the plant floor that the operator is seeing as a starting point. What you really want to do is design a different kind of human machine interface or high performance design uh, that gives the supervisor more high level views to give understanding of where there's an issue. So it's more of a macro level view, right? A different type of view that helps um, them see overall what's happening with indicators of something is abnormal or the situation is bad. And then from there, right, they can go ahead and, and dig in and drill in to exactly what's being seen on the plant floor. So these high level displays are you know, typically more effective if you can show, hey, you know, red or green, good or bad, you know, there's something here. And then they, be, they can go from like seeing that high level view to being able to bridge and seamlessly go right, right down into the exact screen that the operator is seeing, being able to call the operator and, you know, looking at it together and working on it. Get that idea there, right? But, you know, it's important to show the appropriate information that is digestible at scale. So you need to build and design these types of screens. We have scalable visualizations uh, for centralized control rooms and operations and manufacturing control matters, towers. And then another key thing here, you know, back to data access uh, about enabling uh, collaboration. All right, so what we've seen is organizations who are most successful at scale and effective at, you know, implementing improvements um, it's really focusing on enabling collaboration from everything like sharing screens, um, being able to communicate through things like messaging or chat, or it could be even audio communication, right? But the idea is that folks are able to collaborate, they're able to communicate, they're able to quickly find subject matter experts and the right people to help them with whatever the task is. And then another thing here is being able to see the data. So, you know, if only folks on the plant floor can see certain data and the rest has to be sort of verbally communicated, you know, that's going to make it really challenging to be effective versus ensuring accessibility for everyone. And I'm not saying that everyone has, you know, exactly equal access, right? Some folks may only have read access while others, you know, get write access back to the control system. But you really do want to make sure that you're balancing, you know, security while still enabling uh, collaboration. All right, so I'll just touch on a couple of these things. Um, you know, some of the things that are required for a truly scalable solution. So maybe I'll just start with the point that I ended, right? Um, it's about having a modern architecture that really allows for integration and collaboration and having monitoring interfaces. So for example, you know, focusing on ease of information access and ease of information digestion. And, regarding, and in regards to reading and understanding screens, um, you know, ensuring that folks can actually make use of the information that they're presented, it's easily digestible, and that they're able to make decisions and act on it. And then, you know, another thing I mentioned earlier, again, focus on interoperability. You want to make sure that you're looking at standards as part of the technologies and solutions you're deploying, so you can create that systems of systems, right, that network of data that's accessible for anyone who needs it. Another thing here, again, is uh, scalability. So, the idea of having the components um, that you use, make sure that they're able to scale and grow within your system, and that you have the space and capacity you know, to get to your goals. Because hopefully as an organization, you'll continue to grow, and you want to ensure that your systems grow with you. You want to make sure that you have you know, enterprise data management, kind of a strategy to have the right data uh, at the right time and the right speed to the right people in a way that's most cost effective. Right. Uh, we've talked before, um, you know, about starting small, uh, developing something once, being able to reuse it. Uh, we talked a little bit about, you know, making use of things like models and templates so that you can, you know, get reuse out of your existing investment, things that you've already built, being able to capture commonality for ease of management while still allowing for differences between, um, you know, individual equipment or individual plants. Okay, and then you should also be concerned about things like uh, central management, right? So making sure you're able to, 
you know, centrally manage and define something and then centrally deploy it out to all of your systems. All right. So, you know, moving on, um, you know, the idea of having visibility at the enterprise level, but you can really do things like comparisons, right? You want to start doing things where you can look across your enterprise, sort of understand those best practices across different plants, you know, across stations, across lines, and then having sort of transparency where it makes sense. So you can have those frank discussions with folks in your enterprise and really focus on the places that provide um, your biggest challenges so that you can figure out, you know, which to tackle and solve uh, with the, with the um, solutions that you're deploying. Right. Again, uh, security is very, very important to and more important with every day, right? Ensuring secure access, ensuring that you have, you know, secure by design solutions. There's things you can do like, you know, here at GE, we have an independent security team that assesses vulnerabilities with any software. So that really helps to help sort of a separation of interest. So there's no influence from the development team because there's really an independent team um, that's looking at just at security and they ensure that anything with security is prioritized. And of course, leverage your existing technology and investment, right? Your scalability solution will comprise of a number of different components and systems. We're definitely not saying, you know, start fresh, you know, I implement new systems. Hopefully this, if anything, you know, this presentation has, has convinced you that it's really about understanding your users and what their needs are and what the requirements are and ensuring that you know, as you're scaling, you have uh, a fit. The technology choices you have are fit that enables you to do that. So don't worry in there doesn't say that you have to start over or um, start fresh. You can definitely enable, uh, uh, make use of your existing investment. So with that, I think I'm going to go ahead and um, uh, turn it over. I think I think folks, uh, we might want to go ahead and um, carry over questions more to a remote format. Um, my voice is a little bit squeaky today. Again, I'm very very sorry here. I, I got sick, but um, ideally, you guys, if you could just go ahead and, and share any questions in the chat, or you can go ahead and um, email. You can go ahead and, and share an email. Um, and I can try to get back to you and we can also sort of share some answers in our um, presentation afterwards. So that I will uh, turn it over. Thank you, folks. Well, thank you. And I would like to take this time to thank you, Amy, and also thank the audience. Uh, Amy had a very great presentation. But we would also love to thank our sponsor, GE Digital, for sponsoring today's event. This concludes today's e showcase, and uh, we're very appreciative to everyone for attending. Uh, the recording will be available at wefbuyersguide.wef.org, and we will send our registrants an email tomorrow with this link. Please feel free to visit our event calendar to sign up for any future events, and I hope you guys have a great day. Mm -hmm.